Hello and welcome to another edition of 5G Watch. We're calling this one Rothschild PG&E California Fires and the 5G Smart Grid Connection. On this show, what we're going to do is go through a little bit of a critique of a recent video that was put out by SGT Report with Deborah Tavares. Uh, we've got some things we wanted to highlight that were positive about what she said in the interview and we wanted to sort of expand on the information that she just covered very briefly because we want to help people to understand some of the, the points that she was making. But we're also going to say a couple of things that we did not agree with on the interview just to help people understand um, a little bit better about that as well. Before we get started, we just wanted to let everybody know that we have some great products that we would like to tell you about. Tavon and I have written a book called Forbidden Tech. Yes, uh, Forbidden Tech is uh, a body of work that we've put together. Uh, it took a couple of years in its development. Among any, many of the topics covered in the book, you'll learn about free energy, patents, political scandals, murders, cover-ups, engineering basics, cars that run on water, surveillance, gang stalking, energy weapons, and viable solutions to protecting yourself against them. Uh, we've cut out all the fluff and brought you right to the heart of the matter. And our book is available on uh, as an ebook form for $9.99, also as an audio book. Tavon and I have, have read the book out loud to bring the information to life. And that's $14.99. And we have a full video course as well. You can also get the printed book on Amazon for $35. And one more thing we would like to tell you about, especially on our 5G watch shows, is about our EMF protection products. Tavon, can you just tell us how do these products work to protect us from EMFs? Okay, so the products we make, the home decor for EMF protection, basically uh, take the oncoming harmful effects of EMF that come into your home or you know, come into your environment and transform some of those fields uh, into something that's a bit more beneficial, thus creating a shield or buffer around you, your body, uh, around your pets and around your plants. So uh, if you go to our website, ftwproject.com, uh, this is where we make our products uh, that allow you to, for example, get a good nice rest. We have our sleeping pods uh, so that it absorbs some of the energy when you have the pods on or near you uh, in bed. Uh, we also have phone shields to, again, rectify uh, some of those fields that are uh, coming to and being emitted from your cell phone. That, that sticker will fit on all of your uh, uh, cell phone, smartphone uh, devices. Again, all of our products, uh, they're, they're made from a special blend including shungite powder, which is also used um, in painting and lining uh, beehives in order to completely reverse the bee collapse um, because of its ability to transform the harmful fields that were known to uh, basically kill off the bees. And so we take the same technology and we've applied it to uh, these products. And so if you want to yeah, take a look at all of our products on ftwproject.com. Everything is made by hand by us, and we ship worldwide. And worldwide shipping is included in all the prices, especially in our special offers. And tracking as well. All right, so let's begin. Um, in this particular interview that just came out through SGT Report, and we just want to say that we are huge supporters of SGT Report. We really admire Sean's work. Yeah. He has shared one of our videos way back in the past. And hopefully one day we can actually go on his show. That would be fantastic. Um, but we wanted to say well done to putting this together. And yes, yeah. uh, we also are fans of Deborah Tavares. We're very grateful for the information that she has put out over the years yeah. to help bring awareness around these very big topics to yes. a lot of people. Yeah, it's a lot of information. And so with that said, we want to go through this you know, with a, with a really balanced perspective on this, right? Because there's some things that we feel were left out that we wanted to make sure people understood. And she, she, she hit on a couple of really great points, but then she just like very quickly moved on to another point and didn't really expand on that. Right. So we're going to start off with, uh, in the beginning of the interview, she talks about chemtrails mm -hmm. being combustible, mm -hmm. being uh, made out of combustible materials that would help to start fires. And also she talks about smart meters that explode mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how all of that is connected to these California fires that have been put on by the company PG&E mm -hmm. that have been you know, started by them, PG&E, and this company is owned by the Rothschilds. Right. So there's a bigger agenda behind this. So let's just play a few clips here. What has happened here? Because I can tell you, uh, we're traumatized. Uh, it has been a power outage on October 8th and 9th for a number of days, and then another red flag fire warning 
uh, just prior to the start of the Kincaid fire. A red flag fire warning is called by Rothschild, PG&E, to inform us that atmospheric conditions are such with gusty winds and heat that we will uh, potentially have fire. Of course, what is always, always left out is we are very heavily chemtrailed prior to the fires, the announcement of these weather events, and during the fires, heavily, heavily chemtrailed. It's a fresh coating of combustibles of the metals that ignite, and that is what we're facing here, along with the pulsing of the smart meters. The the smart meters have lithium-ion batteries, which explode. All right, so she hit on three things there, and she didn't actually expand on any of those during the rest of the interview. She said she was going to, but I guess they never got around to it. So the first thing I found very interesting was that um, discovering that the the ingredients in chemtrails Mm -hmm. are, in fact, combustible. Yeah. Uh, Well, uh, it's aerosolized uh, heavy metals, and, uh, you know, when you have these uh, at such small sizes uh, under certain conditions, you can... It can in, in, induce the, the things that they coat to ignite. Now, here's the deal. If you're listening to this interview and you are one of those people that thinks that chemtrails are just contrails and it's all a big conspiracy, um, we urge you to please go to, uh, what was it, geoengineeringwatch.com? Uh, yeah, geoengineeringwatch is one, is one, one side out of right. many. Th- there been. are so many scientific studies and, and research that's been done on chemtrails. We're not going to go into that today. We're right. going to assume that our, our listening audience has already come to their own realization that chemtrails are real mm-hmm. and that they're chemicals. But what we're, what we're pulling out here is that they're combustible. Yes, so right. she says that just before the fires happen, and they always leave this out, they, they chemtrail very heavily mm-hmm. over everything to put a fresh coat of flammable material on top of all of the trees and the houses. Yes. Now, I did find an interesting article that talks about the combustibility of chemtrail okay. ingredients. And again, the reason why we're bringing all of this together is because we want people to understand that all of this is related. The chemtrails, the 5G, mm-hmm. the climate crisis, climate change uh, talk in the UN, the smart cities, the smart grids, they're all connected with each other and they're all being used to carry out a bigger agenda. Right. So how does that work? Well, we're seeing now the connection between chemtrails and then later on we go into exploding smart meters. So you've got chemtrails that are flammable, you coat everything with flammable materials, right. and then later on you blow up a smart meter mm-hmm. that is controlled by a 5G tower. Right. So here's an interesting article. Uh, from PR Newswire, aluminum dust from geoengineering fueling super wildfires, according to author. So this was uh, written last year in 2018, but it does go through and shows how a lot of the um, materials from chemtrails are, in fact, flammable. For example, it says, according to California Fire Operation Chief Steve Crawford, the fires are burning differently and more aggressively. It has been reported the fires move faster than anyone has seen, and barriers that in the years past contained them, such as rivers, no longer do. So there's something different about these fires. And it says millions of tons of aluminum and barium are being sprayed almost daily across the U.S., stated Mills a former naval officer and UCLA graduate. Just sprinkle aluminum or barium dust on a fire and see what happens. It's near explosive. When wildfires break out, the aluminum barium dust results in levels of fire intensity so great as to cause firefighters to coin a new term, fire nados. Yeah, so these uh, chemicals that are sprayed into the atmosphere that settles down uh, gently uh, on everything uh, act as accelerants when there is a fire in the area. She also hit on another topic about exploding smart meters. Now, smart meters have lithium ion batteries. Tavon, can you tell us a little bit about lithium ion batteries and why they're why that's explosive? Okay, so the big attraction about lithium ion batteries that uh, everyone seems to be adopting and it's pretty much in most of the battery based uh, electronics and consumer devices now is, is the high current its ability to to provide high current and uh, and and charge uh, 
you know, the ability to charge uh, many cycles and, and, and it's just it's high density, high energy density battery. Uh, so there's this uh, fever uh, race to, to um, basically create these batteries. Uh, but the thing about these batteries is their chemical composition, including uh, chemicals like cobalt, um, they give it uh, the ability to basically become almost nearly impossible to put out once these batteries catch on fire. They've been known to catch on fire. Uh, if anyone's been keeping track with the uh, Tesla electric vehicles and the accidents that, uh, that, that occur with these vehicles, of their battery packs is that, that those battery packs, those are exam examples of lithium ion batteries. And when these Tesla cars catch on fire, you know, often with the drivers inside, um, it, it's because the batteries won't, they, you, you, can't, you, you can't put the battery fire out. I mean, it's a fire from the battery pack itself. So yes, I mean, there have been stories about firefighters having to wait for the car to actually melt down. The chassis actually melts down before they can do anything because the fires are so, so violent. So when you look at these uh, images of uh, these smart meters uh, melting with these battery packs in them, uh, it just gives you an idea of, of some of the catastrophes that you can get with these new, <laughs> these new smart meters. You want to stick to the old analog ones when you look at this. And I hope that we can touch on the whole Tesla electric car Elon Musk, I love to. everything exploding phenomenon. Because later on in, in this interview, um, she goes on about electric cars and how people had to abandon their electric cars and they're, they're forcing everybody to get off uh, fossil fuels and get to electric cars. And when you hear electric car, everybody just thinks Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what we work in is free energy technology, development of different kinds of technology, all of which has been suppressed, and we're gonna talk about that too. But when it comes to electric cars and Elon Musk, we Tavon and I are always like, you know, face palming uh, when we when we hear about yet another car is driving off a cliff. Another another Elon Musk battery is <laughs> blowing up somebody's house somewhere. And yeah. it's it's just it's very frustrating because it is obviously a, um, a setup because there's that technology is not it's not the best technology that we could have how is the company still functional at this point we don't understand we think and and there's like billions of dollars being pumped into it and and all you know Elon Musk every he was like smoking a joint on some show and like he lost like his shares went like they plummeted after that you know stupid decisions are being made mm -hmm. people's lives are being lost yet for some reason electric cars are like the answer and we get very frustrated when we hear about this because there are so many other technologies that we have spent years covering that are better than electric cars but they're all being suppressed mm -hmm. So with that said, let's move through the next point in the interview that we wanted to touch on, which is where she talks about the wildland urban interface, mm -hmm. and they show a map, and we also talk about, she also talks about the, the UN map, and how basically the, the agenda to move everybody out of these country areas and bring them into the cities where they can then lock them into smart grid cities, right? Now let's understand what this is, because Sean, you called it, this is United Nations uh, mandated biodiversity uh, clearance of the wildlands. Again, I mentioned the WUI. And uh, what we have to understand is the wildlands network is the biodiversity treaty mandated by the United Nations, as I said. It is a climate action plan controlling all people, property restrictions, regulations, implementing fines, penalties, conservation easements, and to reduce CO2 emissions or AKA greenhouse gas emissions here in Sonoma County, 25% below 1990 levels by 2015. And that has already come and gone. So I'm going to talk about uh, more because what everyone needs to clearly understand is what is occurring. So she, call, she brought up this website called the WUI, which is the Wildland Urban Interface. I thought this was very interesting so that you can see how they word the agenda. Um, it says... Uh, citizens are moving farther into natural areas to take advantage of the privacy, natural beauty, recreational opportunities, and affordable living. Developers are building neighborhoods to accommodate the influx. As a result, fire departments are fighting fires along the Wild Urban Interface, or UI, defined as areas where homes are built near or among lands prone to wild land, wildland fire. Depending on the area of the country, Fire departments might refer to wildland fires as brush fires, forest fires, 
rangeland fires, or something else. However, they're part of the WUI and all pose the same threat to local assets. The increase in the WUI threat has been steep because of continued development and exposure. The WUI is not a place per se, but a set of conditions that can exist in nearly every community. It can be a major subdivision or it can be four homes in an open range. According to the National Fire Protection Association, conditions include, but are not limited to, the amount, type, and distribution of vegetation, the flammability of the structures, home, businesses, outbuildings, decks, fences in the area, and their proximity to fire-prone vegetation and to other combustible structures, weather patterns, and general climate conditions, topography, hydrology, average lot size, and road construction. The WUI exists in every state in the country. So it's important that we are aware yes. that this is how they're framing this. Mm -hmm. This is what they're, they're um, this is the language that they're using. But we also know that they're they're dumping flammable materials on right. the homes and the vegetation. So how does that affect the wooey or whatever rating that they use? Right. Yes. Yeah. Now the next thing that she gets into, which I found very interesting, and I want to try to tie this together around 5G, is energy weapons. Now, she talks about, she talks about them very quickly, she talks about dustification, mm -hmm. and so you would think, well, what does this have to do with 5G? Yeah. Can you help to explain to Vaughn um, energy weapons, how people think that there's, you know, if you can't see it, it's not a real weapon? Well, I mean, it's like uh, a lot of other things uh, that deal with the contamination of the environment, like, for example, Fukushima and the nuclear radiation fallout, Chernobyl and its fallout. You can't see the, you can't see the necessarily the cause or the problem, but you, you experience its effects uh, through illness. Uh, so the same thing here, we're dealing with uh, energy, and energy in, the, in, in this mode is invisible uh, to, to the human eye. Now, like you mentioned, the term she mentioned, uh, desification, I mean, that was coined by Dr. Judy Wood, who investigated what happened to the buildings on 9-11, uh, based, on, based on the effects that she was able to observe and the information that she gathered as a rocket scientist. Um, as a literal rocket scientist. Literal rocket scientist, okay. We're not, we're not just using that as a phrase. She actually is a rocket scientist. So, um, Here, let, she, let, me, let me bring up some pictures of dustification. Um, of the World Trade Center. So she wrote a book called Where Did the Towers Go? And that book um, is just as valid today as ever because the technology that she concludes that was used uh, on that day is still in effect because it has never been uh, uncovered who were responsible for uh, allowing such a, such a thing to happen using such technology. Um, so the reason why, so Deborah brought this word up, and basically those who survived the initial California wildfire fires of a year ago, um, was 18 months, yeah, two years ago, 2017, right? It's 2017, but I mean, it's, it's just been ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, by looking at the damage in, in 2017, the conclusion was those who came out of that uh, said some of those instances look like it was done by directed energy of yeah. some kind. And so this this is the um this is the theory but there's actually there's a lot of um it's hard to say if it's evidence or proof. It's just kind of like there's way too many unanswered questions. And well, if yeah. you look at it with your eyes, I see I see that this building looks like it's being dustified, just turned into dust. Where did all the steel go? Yeah, but there are some documentaries of her describing her, uh, her work dealing with this subject, Dr. Judy Wood, um, but this relates to the 2017 evidence and videos and uh, photographs that those who were in that, on those wildfire fires in California took uh, to, to, and they did comparisons of uh, what they saw with the damage around the homes, the cars, you know, the metal, um, and, but the trees were unburned and compared it to uh, uh, to 9-11, so that, that's what the tie-in is here. I think this is one of the best pictures, by the way. It shows the, uh, the North Tower spire. This is it when it was steel, and then it just turned into dust. I think it's one of the best photos showing that. Now, we're going to bring up some photos also around the, Calif the California fires and some dustification images. So when she talks about this, you can see what she's talking about. 
So this is just a, a blog post that I found because it had some really good pictures called warpdrivephysics.com and it's showing the fires in 2017 and it had some pictures. Now look at this one. You've got one side of the street, everything is just completely gone. It's all turned to dust, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But the tree was yeah. never touched. Yeah. And then directly across the street, nothing was touched at all. And it shows you before and afters of all the buildings just gone. But the trees are still standing. Mm -hmm. Here's a close-up of that. All the buildings turned to dust and the trees are still standing. So to many people, this appears to be directed energy weapons. Yeah. This is dustification. And what does this have to do with 5G? It's microwaves. Yeah. This is what microwaves can do. Yeah. So is 5G. It's microwaves. Look and, at this. And, and when you combine the, uh, the, the heavily uh, uh, chemtrailed area with the, heavy, with the aerosolized uh, heavy metals and what they're able to do at that particle size as far as act as accelerants uh, on things like, uh, you know, that, that, that are already combustible, then, then it, just, it just makes the whole situation uh, much, much worse. And here's that clip. What we face here now, not only the weaponized fire and the heavy chemtrailing to cause immediate ignition during those days when they uh, used, uh, again, directed energy weapons up on us for the fires. I'm going to explain. All of you saw, many of you saw, the mass destruction that occurred here in California in 2017. Not only the Santa Rosa fires, but of course the burning of paradise and other areas. It was very clear and was becoming easy for people to understand the use of directed energy weapons when everything that was burned was dustified. That is not what happens in regular fires. And when I look at the meeting manuals that are in all of your cities, there is verbiage that is identical. And one of the pieces of verbiage about looking back at the way they did an overkill in all ways with the heavy, heavy assault of directed energy weapons back in 2017 was to now create um, best lessons learned from the fires then to now. They have now created and are now using wind and squall technologies with using the wind to create burned out homes to look more natural. Uh, the results of uh, the debris left behind, what we would normally expect to see after a fire uh, burned through a neighborhood, that is what we now have. We have squall winds. So I found that very interesting how she was able to link mm -hmm. how a couple of years ago it was a little too obvious. Yeah that it was an energy weapon so yeah, now they've, yeah. they've changed it to make it a little less obvious mm -hmm. by using winds but uh, I thought that was a very interesting point to bring out and once again we just wanted to plug our book a little bit because we wrote an entire chapter on energy weapons and we did an entire uh, video course module on energy weapons we go through all different kinds of energy weapons, we show you the patents for them, we show you video clips and examples of them. Uh, this is just a, a link to one of our blogs, the hopegirlblog.com, where you can go and watch this for free, uh, all about energy weapons. And that's from our book, Forbidden Tech. Yeah. Now she mentions that PG&E, which is a Rothschild company, um, is responsible for these fires. And this is an interesting article that came up at the time, um, just before this happened, on November 3rd, 2019, this article came up, over 1,500 California fires in the past six years, including the deadliest ever, were caused by one company, PG&E, and here's what, it could have here's what could have been done, but didn't. And this is from Business Insider. Right. This is not from some, like, you know, conspiracy blog. This is from Business Insider talking about how PG&E is responsible for all of those fires. Gavin Newsom's handling of PG&E crisis stokes comparisons to disgrace ex-governor Davis Enron debacle. Now this was from a couple of days ago. 
uh, the California wildfires aren't just starting to look ugly for PG&E, they're also starting to look ugly for Governor Gavin Newsom. And this article is out of uh, Zero Hedge. Newsom, overseeing the fifth largest economy in the world, has said publicly that he owns the crisis, according to Bloomberg, a public statement that could come back to bite him if he can't get the problem under control quickly. Most recently, Newsom threatened a state takeover at PG&E unless the company could quickly exit bankruptcy and improve its operations. Um, so basically the article continues about uh, his, his poor stewardship and the general opinion of people in California. And it, it basically it just goes on to mention uh, uh, other people who are in California um, uh, are, are basically starting to question Newsom's ability to be able to uh, handle this situation. Uh, here's a quote here. If the situation is not handled, it's very possible it will blow back on Newsom. There's jeopardy for him, depending on how it plays out. And then the article continues about it's not just you know his political career, but also maybe um, for his safety, his personal safety. Because again, we're talking about um, uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of people, but hundreds of thousands of at least uh, of, of uh, residents in California who've lost their homes um, mainly because of this company. And and it's like, what's being done here? It just seems like nothing's being done. And when you do that, when you take when people lose their homes and they see you as the problem, uh, it can get you know it can get really uh, really serious. All right. So now we'd like to move on to something that uh, Deborah said in the interview that we don't really agree with, and that is this microgrid death trap, hmm. right? Yeah. So first of all, maybe she was misspeaking. Maybe she meant something different. But we're gonna play what she says. And it's very extreme. She says that they're, they're putting everybody into these microgrids. And then, Tavon, you're going to kind of unpack that a bit for us after that so you can explain what, what is a microgrid mm -hmm. and why this really isn't what she's making it out to be. Uh, is also the transition of our communities into what is called microgrids. Months ago, we filmed Pacific Gas and Electric uh, reducing an area with cameras and sensors where they could um, literally shut down a certain area uh, electronically from some of their monitoring stations that are positioned in California, in this northern area. And when we talked to the employee that was on the bucket truck on the pole, the telephone pole, uh, adding this box, this unit, and we discussed with him what it was, they are all compartmentalized. He really didn't know what it was, but after querying him for a while, he did say, well, these other companies had gone in and hooked it up, and it was going to be a monitored location. Now, after this experience of the power shutdowns and the fear of running out of power, people are going to clamor for microgrids. Let's talk about what microgrids are. This is a problem. This is a death trap. This is this is a death trap. And she never really defines what the microgrid is yes. and why it's a, you know it, it, that it's a death trap. Yes, but, Tavon, uh, help yeah, us out but, here. But why is it a death trap? And I um, I, I think is in this situation, um, I'm thinking uh, Deborah is referring to smart grids because um, the example she gave about the technician not knowing what, what the boxes are. Uh, but that they're installed by another company, you know, kind of like one one hand doesn't know what the other is doing type of thing. Um, that that more defines of a smart grid where you have not just a, the electric utility, but you have the electric utility with the Internet of Things, with the current technology overlay of communication. Um, and that's that's what smart grids are. It's, it's, it's a platform. And so I'm thinking she's referring to smart grids. In error, she's saying microgrids. And we're hoping that's what it is. I'm hoping that's because, what it is. Because what is a microgrid? Because you said they've been around for like 30 years. Well, I don't know. I mean, depending on how you want to look at it, socially you can make an argument that microgrids have always been around. Um, because mi microgrids are just essentially the opposite of a macro grid. So macro grids are just giant, what we have right now, giant centralized hubs of uh, power generators, where those are the power sources, you know, like some, somewhere in the city, let's say, uh, you know, so like LA or something, where mm -hmm. we've got a giant power generator that's providing power to all of the, not just to the city of LA, but also to the, um, to the urban areas and, 
and you know, and to all the other villages and offshoot towns from that, you know, just gigawatts of energy, right? Um, so that's an example of a macro grid. The problem with macro grids is that if that centralized place goes down, then it's like you're talking about the city and all the city to towns and all the other offshoots branches from that are down also. So potentially tens of millions of people could be affected, right? Mm -hmm. Millions of people could be affected. Um, but what microgrids are, the opposite of a macro grid, are basically um, small community power grids. And, these, and so if you look at an area and you have these towns dotted with towns and, and, and cities, each one of those towns and cities have their own microgrid. They're responsible for their own power generation. And if you look at how power electricity came to the United States, you know, with the, with the inventors of Edison and Tesla and so forth in their battle, um, it started off by those who are wealthy and, and, and influential within their local towns and communities first started adopting um, their power grid. And, and then started to expand outward, and then obviously government worked its way in to allow it to manifest across the entire country. Those are microgrids. Okay? Right. So, they, so that's just how we get our electricity. It's how we it's get our like electricity. That for a long time. Also, and microgrids have always been used for redundancy situations where the macrogrid failed. Mm -hmm. So if you had backup, you needed a backup um, power source from somewhere else. Hopefully, one or two towns in the area also had their own power generator, and they would come online when the macro grid went down. So the, the micro grid has always been there, um, but now I, I think what we have to do is kind of separate out. Well, who's being the steward of that micro grid? Now, um, if you listen to Catherine Austin Fitz, uh, when she talks about some of the solutions that people in communities can do, indeed we do have power. I don't believe for a second that everything's under these people's control. I don't believe mm -hmm. that for one minute. Look, you're in, a, you're in a country with 300 and close to 370 million people, okay? And here's the deal. It, when you start talking about microgrids, that is an opportunity for those who are influential and want to get together to actually care about the community to create a, a company. Um, a, like a, com a community-based company that uh, actually takes over that grid and manages that grid. And also the strongest thing of a microgrid is kind of like a ship with compartments, is you can have compartmentalization. If the power goes down, the whole state doesn't go down. Right. With microgrids, you can actually firewall off the area that, that, that actually is having the problem. Everyone else still has power. So calling it a death trap is a little... It's a little much. No, it's actually our strongest tool. It's not a death trap. It, it, it's, it's the strongest tool. Now, if the argument is, but it's PG&E that's running it, well, um, it, it's just a matter of not allowing bad, bad stewardship to be in control of that microgrid. Also, the incentive of microgrids as well is a lot of power companies, now the larger ones, want microgrids because they don't want to be on the hook for when something goes down and millions of people lose power. They'd rather um, just take for charge a small subsidy and allow the, the, the rewards of those running that microgrid to, to, to reap the rewards of that. And that needs to be people who should get themselves involved. All right, this next part, I think, is probably our biggest beef with, uh, with, with not just this interview, but with this topic in general. And that is, what she's about to do is something that always frustrates me the most. She's about to read out what they're telling everybody to do to, to save energy and to, you know, you know, use the light bulbs or, you know, the mercury light bulbs or whatever. And uh, this is how you can get a zero footprint. And she's, you know, these are like these new laws and guidelines that are being put out there. And this always frustrates me to no end. And the reason why is because no one will ever even mention free energy and the suppression of the hundreds, if not thousands, of free energy devices that are real, that work, that exist, and that have been sequestered and suppressed by these energy industry giants. Not even the alternative news people, they won't even touch free energy with a 10-foot pole. We've tried. We've, we won't mention names, but we have tried to get onto certain people's shows to talk about free energy, to tell, you know, we've, we've spent years of our lives uh, devoted to working with free energy on our own. Um, we build devices ourselves. We've written a book, Forbidden Tech, that, that goes through all these different free energy devices. No one will ever even go near them. 
Instead, all we hear about is how you have to save energy, and they act as if it doesn't even exist. Yes. And it's very, very, very frustrating. So that's one of my biggest beefs about this. Um, Tavon? No, I'm just in agreement. Um, <laughs> it, you know, the, th the thing here is um, one of the solutions has to be everyone has to look at each other and say, okay, who in our family and community can work with their hands? Mm -hmm. Because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of larger problems that are happening. I, I, if it's even possible to, to think that. I mean, but there are large factors at play for why governments are behaving the way they are. Okay, um, and with these changing events that are happening cur uh, currently, it's forcing uh, everyone to really reconsider what kind of skill sets they have. But one of them has to be, someone better be an electrician, someone better be a plumber, and be able to start patching together, um, you know, if they have to re relocate, uh, looking, looking to use those skills in order to um, be a functional part of whatever new community ends up forming out of all of this. And here's the other part about that. We've come to a full circle moment, I believe. Years ago, when people were trying to say, please support DIY free energy engineers. Please support this work because they are financially cut off. No one will fund the free energy work. Instead, billions of dollars go to people like Elon Musk, as an example, and many other morons just like him, right? And why? Because this stuff is being suppressed. No one will support it. On top of that, you will get trolled and ridiculed and with, by the mockers and scoffers of the world who will just make fun of you and laugh at you and say that you're a fake, you're a fraud, you're a scammer. And it's those same mockers and scoffers who are now complaining that they don't have their cell phones working, that their power grids are failing, that everything is going down. Where were you? Where were you 10, 20, 30 years ago when the free energy people were trying to get some support? Right. Yeah. Where were you then? Yeah. Right? So here we are now, and, I'll, and I will tell you, because it's very frustrating, there are plenty of free energy devices that are in operation that people are using right now in their homes, and these people are not affected by the power grid going down. And they're not going to tell anybody. And they're not going to tell anybody, and we know for a fact that this is true. We know for a fact that this is true. Here's one example. Yeah. There was a big power outage on the West Coast in America, and I remember this Facebook post, everybody else has no power, here's my setup. And this guy had his, everything was working, and he was running it off of all different kinds of different free energy devices that he made himself. But nobody supports that work. Instead, we're all going into gloom and doom with, oh, we have to lower our energy consumption. And it frustrates me because it's a lie. It's a lie. Not it's really. not true. It's not real. And I'm reading from what my county has adopted. So they go on to say, whereas there are established, they've established 20 goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and nine goals to prepare for local climate impacts. And listen to this. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Sonoma County agrees to work towards the countywide target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% below 1990 levels by 2030 and 80% below 1990 by 2050. Now, this is vitally important to understand. The real goal of energy use is aiming for zero. This is why you're getting psyops with hearing zero waste, uh, zero you know waste being you need to compost, but you need to understand, we found this on the U.S. Department of Energy website uh, on uh, some years ago, and it's on StopTheCrime.net. It's also in my five-part uh, video YouTube series on Stop the Crime. Uh, and it says, this is the ultimate goal to not use energy. The most efficient energy is energy we do not generate. This is not a technology. This is a behavior modification or learning to live in a new reality. Well, I want to tell you, when they turned off the power here in Sonoma County, they disrupted the cell phone towers. People did not have communication. Right now, we're also understanding that the repeaters for ham radio operators are being eliminated. Communication is being eliminated. For all of you that are listening, we are being cordoned off 
We're being sectionalized into grids with energy reduction. We're being uh, forced into electric vehicles that must be charged and cannot be charged when your power is turned off. And this is the goal. Now I'm going to read some more of this resolution that was adopted in my county. This stands for the United States of America Incorporated as well. And again, it's in my county. It's in your county too. Uh, be it further uh, resolved that Sonoma County adopts the following goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and will pursue local actions that support these goals. Number one, increase building efficiency. Now I want to talk about that briefly. Uh, retrofitting will be required in all existing housing and there will be PACE loans and there are PACE PACE loans which are Rockefeller loans and Rothschild loans that uh, sit up on and over your mortgages so that you can borrow the money required uh, to avert code violations by retrofitting out of anything that's currently gas in your home. All natural gas is now, I don't want to play too much more of that because she goes on and she reads this long laundry list of all these requirements that they're now, they're, they're trying to make all these changes so that people can spend more money um, to, to retrofit their house uh, with more efficient things and use less energy. And every time I hear any of these laundry lists of all the different things that you need to do to conserve energy and conserve this and conserve that, it drives me crazy because they don't, it's because they, they come at it, I mean, it sounds good. Yeah. It sounds like really nice, it's right. like sugar-coated, like, oh yeah, I want to save the planet. It sounds really benevolent, mm -hmm. but we know that it's a bunch of BS yes. because they yeah. never mention all of the energy technology that we've had for well over 100 years well over a hundred years and it's just it's been suppressed right right so it's it's so it's just I don't like being lied to yeah yeah I, I I'll, but you know what's interesting about this is again the the, the agenda because this is tied to uh, agenda 2030 that we covered in the previous program uh, it is about behavior right um, now strangely enough it with we also talked about the grand solar minimum mm-hmm and how that is a real super cycle that is um, basically uh, happening right now. It's just starting to happen as far as the extreme changes in climate and, and weather. So, you know, that people, we need, we need to look at this really seriously um, and, and just factor that in and, and put a bit more perspective on, on uh, the larger, larger, grander things that human beings cannot control. Um, but we know that when these things do happen, uh, huge climate shifts also occur and if that's the case, then you know you might need to look at composting when certain systems in the infrastructure go down. And composting inside of an apartment is, you know, it's not always fun or very convenient, but you can learn how to do it. It's not a big deal. Yeah. And I'm really glad you brought up the grand solar minimum because there is a there's a skewed and incorrectly biased and skewed way of presenting this climate change information in general, and that is that all of it is man-made it's all our fault or it's all due to some agenda it's all because they're doing harp and they're doing chemtrails all those things are real there are things that that humankind is doing to affect the environment there are uh, disasters that are not necessarily natural that are being caused by like energy weapons and stuff and harp and, and different things however, however. There's also the grand solar minimum, which is a natural phenomenon about that comes from the sun that has nothing to do with the new world order, the cabal, or energy weapons, or man-made climate yeah, we, change. And we, we covered that in previous in the previous episode. We'll probably talk more about it again because again, um, the the more extreme weather, it isn't it isn't about. A bunch of people using harp weapons uh, because again if you don't look at things like the grand solar minimum which at this point is becoming established science mm -hmm. in the past two years if you're not looking at that then then what you're basically doing is describing all the ills of the environment to a bunch of people and they, so you're giving them all this power and um, I just think that that's that's uh, it's wrong it's not right Again, go and check out this show that we did on our Real Speaks show, and this one's called The Chinese Trade Wars, Communism versus Christianity, PG&E Fires, Grand Solar Minimum, Extinction Rebellion. We covered, like, the second half of the show. 
yeah, we that, covered that was a fairly Grand long Solar show. Minimum. So yeah. uh, go ahead and check out that show. And the last point that we want to touch on in this interview is this one point where she she says pretty much there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide, right? And so Tavon and I were just like, oh come on, that's that's a little over the top. It's like, well, what are the, and, the, and then there's that there's no solutions. She offers zero solutions, like you know, and she talks about people leaving California and thinking that they're that they're under the illusion that they can go somewhere and they can leave the problem, but there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. Just love your family and burn is basically like the solution that she offers at the end of the interview. It's like there's nothing you can do. Just love your family and just burn. You know. So so we want to say we don't we don't feel that way. We don't think that there's nothing you can do. And there's reasons why people are leaving California and it, it doesn't really have much to do with the fires. Yeah, yeah, it's one of many. But let's first play the clip where she says that. The banksters through your utilities and then creating microgrids so that small areas can just be eliminated easily and most people won't even know. So let's talk about what has been adopted in all of your cities, in every city, every county, everywhere, they're the climate action plans. The United States is on full uh, speed forward on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Make no mistake about it. Simply go to your state, your city, because people are fleeing California with the illusion that they just can't live with these fires and these outages and they're going to move to Montana or they're going to move to Texas. We have talked to many people that do not understand the agenda. There is nowhere to hide. Nowhere. So, this another one of our pet peeves. <laughs> and this is with a lot of different shows that we watch, is that people come on and they just want to, you know, it's like awareness, awareness. They want to scare you and they want to tell you how bad it is. It's so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad. Thanks for having me on your show. Bye-bye. And then they're like... <laughs> They don't offer any solutions. They just leave people in a state of fear and terror. And we think that is awful. That is not true. You need to give people some real hope and give them some real facts behind stuff. So we, we always try to throw solutions. And whatever happened to the into uh, our shows. The, the old slogan, you know, you die trying, right? Just if there's nothing if there's nothing to left to lose. What well, do, do you have to lose then if, if, if you're gonna if, if you can plan on leaving? I had I had a really interesting time reading through some of the comments uh, underneath this video of um, SGT report. Uh, it was a lot of people are Christians that uh, listen to it, and a lot of them are like, oh, "She needs Jesus," you know, because this concept of it's all the cabal, it's all satanic, and and you know God's not in control, and it you know that. Well, yeah. we, we agree we, we've that, had our share of that we we agree that um, you know God is in control. God's on His throne, and <laughs> you you can't give the enemy that much power, yes. right? So so that bothered us. It's not true that there's no way to run. There's no way to hide. There's plenty of places in America and, and that you, you can and, go to where it's going to be better on all different millions levels. Millions of people leaving California. There is a there is a particular set of circumstances in that state mm -hmm. that is causing mass migration. So the people of California need to take heed, in another country, need to take heed of why that mass migration situation is happening. Not just call them, oh, the, you know, they're they're in the, they're missing, you know, they're they're misinformed. All of them, they're misinformed. And yeah. It, you, you know, they're, they're, people will do what they need to do to survive. And survival often in history, human history means voting with your feet you leave and you flee and you see from a distance what's going on yeah. and, and we know and we've talked about and others have talked about the problems that are happening in California mass and, and we you know look we pray for the California uh, people in California during, during during times like these fires every um, night we do but we know that there's more things going on uh, simply dealing with the uh, the corruption just the general corruption well, and I completely understand, and I have sympathy, because I believe in the interview she said that the fires raged through her neighborhood. Exactly. And she went through um, some of the things going on where the insurance companies are canceling things, and people people can't sell their homes. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of 
really nasty stuff and I think she's right in the thick of it and, th and there's and there's trauma she said that they're traumatized and I'm sure that if she's right in the thick of it she's part well, of she's doing the interview right during this time of this traumatic time but we want to say that there there has been this mass exodus of people that are all leaving California they're leaving for different reasons there's plenty of other places in the United States where you can go where it's cheaper it's healthier. They don't have 5G all over the and place. And they don't have wildfires. And they don't have the wildfires. And they don't have all the restrictions and the cost of living. And just the cost of like doing anything is much more reasonable. Um, there's plenty of places to go. Or you could even leave the country. Now, now that's a thought. Because she also applies this to it's everywhere in the whole world. And that is not true. Yeah, because it's something that's written down on paper by a bunch of sociopaths doesn't mean it made it so globally at the no, same time. There are, is, the, the world does not operate that way. Yeah, we, we don't live in America right now. And we live in a place that it might as well be a different planet from what's going on over there. Because that is not, that's not the rest of the world. It's just this one little focused area. And we happen to be of the belief that if you can get out of California, yeah. you should. Yeah. You should. And I know it's hard. I know it's expensive. It wasn't easy for us to leave where we came from in order to go to another place. But we did it. And with the full understanding that it's going to split family units down, split you know, friends apart. But that's that's these kind of times you know this is what happens and a lot of people are saying things especially like in the comment section like you that people in California need to write letters to their representatives and I know that that's always something people say but I have show me once in the last 10 years where writing a letter to a representative has ever done anything for anyone anywhere because I haven't seen it mm -hmm. it's like no you have to take control of your life control of your family yeah. And say, I don't care if people make fun of me. I'm going to go do, I'm going to take another path. And yeah. I'm going to choose a different path. I'm going to choose life. And I'm going to get out of this. Uh, it's it's Well, doing that, against it's the wishes, doing that against the wishes of your friends and family was probably one of the most difficult, difficult things you can possibly do in your life. Believe me, we know. Because we've it's been it's through very it. very tough. We've been through it. When you have to leave and everybody thinks you're a traitor because you left your, your home area and you went to a different place to have a better life, this is what happens. But we just want to give you a couple of examples here that, you know, she, she made it sound like everybody's leaving California, people shouldn't leave California or, or that nobody is um, staying there only because of the fires and the power. But that's not the case. There's many other reasons why people are leaving California. A huge one is politics. And finance. And finance. Politics and finance are two big ones. And here's an interesting article that Tavon found. And this is out of the Los Angeles Times. Uh, California conservatives leaving the state for redder pastures. So this is political. Yeah. So this is a this is particular political art article talking about how this couple this uh, uh, couple left California for Texas, uh, and uh, the re the reason the reasons why. Um, like and the article goes on, like many voters who lean to the right in California, the retired couple have decided to leave the state. A major reason, Stark and her spouse say, it's their disenchantment with deep blue California's liberal political culture. Uh, despite spending most of their lives in the Golden State, they were fed up with high taxes, lukewarm support for local law enforcement, and policies they believe had thrown open the doors to illegal immigration. Now. Independent of what your political, um, what side of the fence you're on, some of those bullet points, I'm pretty sure, um, are things that you're probably looking at. In the, independent of what what affiliation, what party affiliation you have. Um, it goes on. Uh, Stark and her husband decided it was time to put their Modesto home up for sale about six months ago. After doing some research online, she came across the website Conservative Move, which, as the name suggests, helps conservatives in California relocate the liberal states from liberal states to redder ones such as Texas and Idaho. And uh, is the, this the article that that talks about where everybody? I'm is, not sure. I think it does go on uh, actually breaking down the statistics in the past two years of the number of states in the Midwest that have uh, yes. accepted. Um, the migration from Cal uh, from people from California uh, residents, and uh, it just goes to staggering numbers talking about the m millions of the millions of Californians, what states they've settled into. Texas by far was like the most popular. 
Yeah, like this This says here, between 2007 and 2016, California lost 1 million residents to domestic migration. About 2.5% of its total population, according to a 2018 report from the State Legislative Analyst Office. Texas was the most popular destination. And a 2019 relocation study found that 63,175 Californians moved to Texas in 2017 the article goes on and says that the, the people who are moving into California tend to be wealthier people um, who settle in some of the areas uh, for business reasons. Um, but the, like the retirees and, 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 and other, other people are moving out from California to places like Texas and, and other uh, states within the Midwest. But what we really want to recommend is this video right here from Prepper Princess, and it's called Why California Sucks, and it is an incredible video because it's this wonderful woman, um, and she says check out her website, PrepperPrincess.com, so we'll go ahead and plug that for her, but um, she just goes through a comparison. She's lived in California like her whole life, or she, she was like, um, here's a comparison to what it was like 10 years ago, and she starts to give prices and just all these differences in California, and she's not even talking about the politics. It's just the cost of living, um, being able to drive around because the traffic is so bad. She talks about all the regulations and how there's so many regulations. It's like you can't do anything without getting all these permits and approvals and things, which has always been a huge um, contention of mine, why I didn't want to be in certain areas in, in the states, because you can't do anything on your own house, right? Um, and all different sites, types of things. She even talks about the, um, the trees and the fires in the trees and how you're not allowed to cut your trees down uh, around the, the, the electric lines, and that's part of the reason why there's so many fire problems. So let's just play one little minute clip here about, of this video to give you a taste, and we recommend that you check out the whole thing. I'll talk to you about the difference that I've seen in California, California in the last 20 years and why there's going to be a mass exodus, or there is a mass exodus, of people leaving the state. So let me start with the cost of living. The cost of living in the Bay Area has risen exponentially in the last 10 to 20 years. I will give you some examples. My last apartment that I had 10 years ago was $850. That same apartment now goes for $2,400 per month for a one bedroom. So that number alone was shocking. I don't know how anybody can pay rent like that. That's insane. Yeah. Um, also, in that article from the LA Times, uh, the rate at which people were leaving California was also going up. So, if you have a, an increasing rate, then that that means you have you're going to have an exponential um, number of people leaving over the next couple of years. Yeah, and I know that you know it's a, it's a it's pretty in California. I've been there. It's really pretty mm -hmm. and. Yeah. You got the, the ocean, is really nice, and people like certain areas because of the way it looks. But there's plenty of other places in America that are absolutely stunning and beautiful and pretty, and that have plenty of ocean lines and things, and you don't have to live in that particular state with all of those horrendous politics that are going on, and fires. It's, it's awful what's going on. And there, also, so. um, each state, uh, <laughs> although it's in the Union, look, each state has its own set of laws, and um, so there's a bit of a firewall there. Uh, depending on what what you want to go for. So, so with that said, we're going to wrap up the show. That was just a little bit of an overview of the most recent interview that came out from Deborah Tavares, and we thought that she had on some really interesting points when yes, it came yes. to um, things that we think is related to 5G because it's part of the smart grid and it's part of what's coming. And we hope that this helps to spread some awareness, but to also give you guys a little bit of hope that it's not just all doom and gloom, and you don't have to be as scared. Um, as people are trying to make you out no, to be. No, but yeah, take, take charge, take charge. Absolutely. In your family and also in your local community. And, you know, like we say, we do this show every single week, and in these shows we are always talking about different solutions of things that you can do in order to protect yourself from 5G, to yes. protect yourself from EMFs, and the smart grid, and all different things that you can do. So go ahead and look at some of our previous shows to get some of those solutions and those ideas. And also check out our website as well because we've written lots of different articles and we've included scientific studies and research to show you the, the different things that you can do yes. to protect yourself and your family. So with that said, thanks everybody for watching. Thank you everyone. And we will see you next time on 5G Watch. Bye.